put on this just so that uh, there are a few folks who uh, who said they couldn't be here today, um, so we'll do that. Um, yeah, we'll get started, and maybe a few others will join um, as uh, yeah as we get rolling. But uh, I'll just start by saying uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Josh Hadro. I'm the managing director of the AAAF Consortium, um, which is a small set of staff, three folks who um, you know who are supported by institutions in the community to. Uh, help promote the work of the community, the development of the APIs, the gathering of collections, the, the creation of tools um, like we'll talk about here today um, that do really new, useful and interesting things. Um, and in this case, uh, working with AV, which is one of the great new functionalities in the AAAF universe. Um, so yeah, I'm really just here to give a welcome and um, uh, I know some of you have been at some of the other workshops, um, but we try to do things like this, you know, as frequently as possible. This one is um, kind of connected to the AAAF conference that we had um, just a couple weeks back. Um, but uh, I won't give too many links, but I do just want to add um, one link uh, to make folks aware of it, that we do offer um, some more general online AAAF training. Um, there's uh, at that link I just put in the um, into the chat. Um, we have kind of a, uh, you can follow at your own pace. There's all these recordings and it's uh, all sorts of exercises that you can do um, on your own time. It's it's sort of developed to be a five day training course um, with just a little bit of work each day. It's not, you know, it's not a full time job or anything, but we also do offer um, guided versions of the training. So we do that usually about once a month and there's a training session coming up in July if if that's useful to you, um, either the free and open access version or um, or the guided version, uh, those are those links are available there. So um, I will kind of stop talking there and hand this over. I'm really happy to have uh, Tanya Clement and Kaylee Voss um, to lead this workshop on Audi Annotate um, and the extensible workflow. Um, yeah, and you can introduce it from there. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I'm Tanya Clement. I'm an uh, associate professor in the English department at the University of Texas, uh, primarily working in digital humanities, but I've been focused on audio for um, about 10 years now, I think. Uh, and um, I'm going to give a brief introduction. And then Kaylee Voss, uh, who is a graduate student and is part of a dual degree that I run at the University of Texas uh, between the English department and the School of Information. Uh, Kaylee is going to walk you all through. Um, oh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I don't know if someone else has their. There we go. Now it's gone. Uh, Kaylee's going to walk you all through um, how to use the Audi Annotate application and um, a little bit of time maybe for some hands-on, but really we can we can put that power in your own hands. Uh, so we'll only be here about an hour today, um, but happy to take questions. So I'm gonna get started and share my screen. Make sure it's actually sharing the right screen. It is, excellent. Let me get rid of your lovely faces. So, um, Audi Annotate started with um, an ACLS grant, uh, American Council of Learned Societies. Uh, and what it began was uh, with was this idea that we have these audio collections in cultural heritage institutions. And um, as a humanities scholar, I find that I can't do some of the basic, what John Unsworth would call primitive activities in the humanities, including uh, annotation um, with AV materials. So if you have, I work a lot with uh, poetry recordings, um, with poetry performances. And if you have a poem where you're used to being in a poetry class and you move around your poem in the class and everybody annotates and shares and they look at the same poem, et cetera, that kind of work is difficult to do with an audio recording. Um, similarly, if you're doing research, unless you have a digital version on your own computer. Um, it, it's very difficult to create notes on it, to share those notes, to present those notes, um, to do some of these basic primitive, um, meaning you know, essential and foundational um, uh, activities in the humanities. So 
we created this project um, and this application, and then we went for further funding from Mellon, which is what we're, we're being funded with right now, to make sure that we could actually close the loop on this activity. So um, not only create annotations and make them IIIF um, available, but if a library or cultural heritage institution makes their materials available as IIIF, can we actually create a workflow where a person can take those things, create annotations, and then if the cultural heritage institution wants to, they could harvest them back in and actually add them into their collection. So that's become the last part of, um, of what we're seeing as a feedback loop um, in the context of you know, scholarship and teaching, as well as um, the materials that cultural heritage institutions give out, but also maybe want to take back in. Maybe, they don't have to, and I'll show you why. Uh, so um, what we created here, let me tell you who the team is first. Um, our team includes myself, as well as Ben and Sarah Broomfield of Broomfield Labs. They've actually, um, they're the ones who have developed the application itself. Uh, as well as a team from AVP uh, and Aviary. So Aviary is also developing on their end. Um, they have developed the ability to produce uh, IIIF uh, in, in a way that functions in the context of our workflow. We, Audi Annotate can take it in. Um, anybody that can take IIIF could take it in, um, but we've made sure that it's sort of a seamless um, transition between those two um, to, as, as an example, to show this kind of cross work between cultural heritage institutions and individual scholarly work. Um, a host of graduate students like Kaylee have, have helped with this project uh, as well as project partners. So for us, it was really essential since we were using IIIF in a new way, uh, using AV IIIF, it was essential to have, to have examples. So we're working with um, Doug Boyd of Ohms. Uh, they have an, it, they, they work really closely with Aviary. Uh, Jason Camlot and the Spoken Web Project, uh, which is a consortium of poetry collections all across Canada. Uh, the Christina Davis at the Woodbury Poetry Room at Harvard, um, as well as Labs at the Library of Congress uh, and um, Furious Flower, which is a project of poetry readings at James Madison University. Um, recordings like we'll show you today from the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas and um, Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to give you this very useful, uh, here's my chat, link to everything that you need in order to do this on your own. Um, and I've given you some background. Um, I wanna show you the projects and then Keely, I'm gonna show you kind of in Martha Stewart style, I'm gonna show you the, the, the beautiful pie as it, as, it, as it has been cooked. And then Kaylee's gonna show you how to make it. Um, so a really simple example is, a, is, a, is, is an exhibit that I've created um, using Audi Annotate, using GitHub, uh, which is an essential part of this project. We um, decided that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel of, um, you know, metadata formats like IIIF. Uh, so we're using that. Uh, we are heavily using GitHub as a repository for the files. Um, we are also not creating tools for annotation. So um, to annotate your audiovisual files, uh, there's various free things out there. There's various paid things that you can use. But as long as you can, you can extract those annotations as a TSV or a common delimited file, um, XML uh, in the case of OMS, uh, you, you can actually use this project to create IIIF with those assets. So uh, as Kaylee will show you, the only thing that you actually need in order to create this project like the one I'm showing you is um, a URL to an AV file uh, as well as your annotations. And that's pretty much it. Um, uh, and then our tool actually generates these pages for you in uh, GitHub for, based on your credentials in GitHub. So you have control over everything and they're just flat static uh, files that um, if, if our application goes away and dies, they will still exist in your GitHub account and, and function as you're seeing here. Um, we went very simply. These create very simple web pages of the annotations linked with the 
AV files um, in part because if people wanna be more extravagant with them, they can, but our objective is to create IIIF manifests and to create these um, pages for sharing annotations. So let me show you a couple of examples and then I'm gonna hand it over to um, Kaylee. So this is an example of audio recordings that exist in the Library of Congress. I have created annotations on them. Um, I've created a uh, introductory essay that I can link in my project. Uh, and um, the audio files look something like this. So this is pulling in audio from the Library of Congress. Uh, so if I play it, Place. I'm not sure if you can hear it. It's not essential. Um, and if I were to go to this actual page, um, I've included the link to the original file. You don't actually get, you get a little bit of background information, um, but you don't get kind of timestamp level information on what's happening on those audio files, which is what I've included here. So, um, you know, this is a project about Zora Neale Hurston. So I've included places where Hurston speaks, like this one. Um, and, uh, and um, or, you know, I've also included where there are songs. Uh, and I've labeled these particular annotations as, as songs. This is where instruments are playing, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, I can orient these in various ways. Uh, these are the Library of Congress notes that actually appear on the live, on the uh, audio file. Uh, another example of ways that we've used um, audio annotate is uh, the students uh, who there is a John Beecher audio recording at the Harry Ransom Center that is um, of some civil rights students that were arrested. Some of the language is. Um, is, is not great. And they wanted to create a lesson plan around um, this particular audio file. So they uh, you know, have some introductory materials um, and they have also embedded the, um, the audio into the page. Sorry, I'm moving around it very well. It's the example project. Uh, and you can see how the audio is embedded on the page with context. And they've created um, transcriptions as well as marking the places where they feel like there might be a um, trigger for particular readers. And this is a way to create context around a recording that didn't previously have context. Um, let me give you one last example, and then I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee. Uh, another example that's a pretty good one is um, this one by another graduate student that was working with us, um, Janet Reinschmidt. And she, again, induction materials, this time this is a video. Uh, and it works in very similar ways. Uh, what's particularly interesting about Janet's project is that um, she has also used another third party tool called um, Hypothesis to create additional annotations on her annotations. And what this allows is this allows, so hypothesis is not uh, oriented to anything that we do, but because we have created a, um, we've created this web presence, uh, the, um, and because it's based on IIIF and follows the WC3 um, web annotation format that IIIF follows, it, coordinates well with other third party projects like Hypothesis, which allows you, Hypothesis typically allows you to add annotations to any web page. So what this means is that a person can come in from the public, actually add annotations to Janet's annotations, and it becomes a kind of conversation. Um, so I think Kaylee's gonna show you this stuff, but I wanna show you very quickly um, where, what happens, uh, what's created very, very quickly, what's created in GitHub. So if I go back to my project and um, actually I don't think it's gonna show up here. Sorry, uh, let's see, I think this goes straight into GitHub. I'll go to my account. Um, 
you see my various repositories. And you know, one of them is this um, Jacksonville repository. Now what's created, so Audiana Take creates this repository for you. It creates the manifests for you. They are here, um, they are shareable. They are what drives those web pages that you saw. And um, we create the simple Jekyll site that sits in your GitHub account, as you can see here. And like I said, then these are your files. You can change them, you can edit them, you can update them. But what Audio Annotate really produces is these manifest files. Um, and Katie will show you how in a second. And um, it allows you then to have these simple web pages, share your annotations, as well as have the manifest file that can function well and coordinate with other um, information management systems. I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee. Uh, she's going to show you how to make these things. I'm going to stop sharing uh, as soon as I can get back to my page. And thank you very much. OK, thank you, Tanya. I'm going to share a, a link in the chat. This is kind of like a step by step process of what I will walk through today. So feel free to follow along or just keep that for maybe in the future if you ever return and want to actually build a project. So I will share my screen now. That's that link that I just sent you. So I'm just going to walk you through a very basic outline of how you're going to how you would go about making your audio annotate project. The first step is to find an audio file that you're interested in working with and that is usable in the audio annotate um application so the material can come from your personal collection if you have an audio file on your computer it could come from any kind of digital archive that's managed by libraries or museums or universities or the government basically anywhere so long as you can either get a direct link to the material you can download it and create your own direct link or you can access an existing IIIF manifest so sometimes institutions will provide a direct link for you on the items page. That's not super common. Um, usually you'll have to dig around for it a little bit. So for example, I'm showing you this page for an Alice Walker poetry reading that's held by the Library of Congress. Nowhere on this page are they gonna have a direct link to the file itself, which is a link that's gonna end with the uh, file format. So it should end like .mp3. And that doesn't exist anywhere on this page visibly, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist at all. So something you can do is you can always look at the page source that opens up the HTML code for the page. And then searching through here, we should be able to find the direct link. So I just command F and search .mp3. It pulls up this link. And if I click it, you'll see that it is the audio player here in all by itself. And this is the direct link up here in the search bar that ends with .mp3. So that link we could use to pull this audio into um, Audi Annotate. Another thing that I have noticed often happens when I'm searching for direct links is that certain pages, like this other page, um, also from the Library of Congress, they'll have a download option. And more often than not, when you actually click the download button, it just opens that same direct link in the page rather than starting a true download. So this link, again, you could use to pull this audio into Audio Annotate. But then again, sometimes when you click a link, it does actually trigger a true download. So this is a page from the Harry Ransom Center at UT. Um, it's a recording. I have to scoot you over a little bit so I can get to the download button here. So you can download the recording. And when you hit the button, it will actually just start downloading the MP3 file locally to your own computer. And that's great in terms of access for certain things, but I'm not actually able to put a file directly into Audi Annotate. So when I download this file, what I have to do is put it somewhere else where I can generate a direct link for it. So let's go ahead. Oops. What I do to do that, we've realized you can do this via box now. 
of course, it's not going to let me log into Box because I'm in incognito. Um, let's see. So let me just get out of incognito, actually. I did this because it helps a little bit when I'm doing um, it forces me to log into stuff so you don't actually miss any steps in the process. But let's see. Let me go ahead and share just so that you can see this step. So I'll log into Box. Box is a file sharing platform. It's the one that UT uses for kind of everything. So I have an institutional um, access, but you should also be able to have access just from a private account. So when you upload a file into Box, so for example, here, you can go in to share it and you create a share link with this little toggle button here. That share link is actually not the link that you need. You'd have to go into link settings and scroll down and you'll see there is a full direct link. And this one ends with MP4 with the file format. So you know that that's an actual direct link to the file itself. And that link you would be able to put into Audio Annotate. So that works. Um, I have to start here again. Here we go. So. Sometimes you can generate your own direct link if one doesn't already exist for you. Um, that's an option. Um, and then the other option, final option, is to pull in an existing IIIF manifest. So as probably everyone on this Zoom realizes, it's not incredibly common for institutions to make the manifest readily available to end users of their website. Part of the Audi Annotate project is convincing our partner institutions that doing so facil facilitates research and makes it easier for people to collaborate on digital humanities projects using their audio files. And we have managed to make that case to the Harry Ransom Center. And so they have made all of the um, audio files in their digital collections. All of those have a IIIF manifest available to users. So. I'm on this page for, this is an interview with Alice Walker. If I open up the mirror door viewer, which is just another way of viewing the audio player, um, I can get into this menu and scroll all the way down. And at the bottom, you can see there's a link for the manifest. So I could open that, that's what it looks like. But the only thing I'll need to work in Audi Annotate is the URL up here at the top. So. Those are your options when you're looking for audio to use in your project. Once you have chosen your audio, you can go ahead to the Audio Annotate website uh, and you'll just have to sign in. Like Tanya was saying, it, your Audio Annotate account works in tandem with your GitHub account. So you will need a GitHub account in order to use Audio Annotate. And it will authorize the application. So here we're on my page where all of my projects live. I can edit any of those with the blue edit button that you see. And then down here, I'll hit new project for the purposes of this walkthrough. And this is going to open up a page where you enter some preliminary information about your project. Everything that you put in here is sent to GitHub to set up your repository which means that you'll be able to edit it through your GitHub account at any time if you want to. So, I'll just do workshop description, use for audio file, and then it helps you, it builds the you make sure you have any spaces, you should use dashes instead and keep it kind of short and sweet. Do you wanna turn off oh. your video? You're breaking up a little bit. Ooh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that might help. Thank you. Okay, so hit create project and it's gonna build, it might take a minute here. It's building your GitHub repository and making it ready for you to add all of the data that you want. So ready for us to start importing our audio. 
So you have these three options here, create item manifest, import existing manifest and create page. When you create a page that doesn't necessarily have an audio file connected to it, that could be like Tanya was showing you what she had a page with um, an introductory essay. Those first two buttons are how you're gonna add actual audio visual items. So first I'll show you how it works when you have to create an item manifest. So click that button. And then you'll have to enter the metadata for the item you've selected. So I'm going to do, I'm going to use the audio from the Library of Congress, which right here. So I'll copy that link, come back over here. That URL goes in here. For the label, I'll just use the title that they have given. Here we go. So that's the title they gave. We need the duration for this one. It is 52 minutes and 45 seconds. Item homepage URL, I'll just use the landing page where the item lives on the Library of Congress. And then Congress is the name of the provider. And their URL is loc.gov. So I'll hit save. And you can see item manifest was successfully created, pops up right here. And that's that. So there's also um, a button up here that's right now showing building. Eventually that will say ready. Once it says ready, then we know that the audio file has been added and it exists on the web page and we can go and visit it there. So now I'm gonna go back into the higher level and show you how you import an existing manifest. So we'll use the Ransom Center uh, manifest that I pulled up this one. And I'll copy that URL and that's all you have to add because the manifest will import all of the other metadata that the Ransom Center has made available for you. So you're not gonna have to add that manually. So you hit save. And again, you'll see item manifest successfully imported it's building, as soon as it will be ready. Once it is ready, I will sh show you what it looks like. So we'll just give it a second to build. And then I can show you um, how you access the IIIF manifest via the public facing website that this is building. So you can see there's links here. This is how you would get into your actual GitHub account and start making any edits that you wanted to make from the other end. It's taking a nice long time, but let's see, maybe it's ready. So one of them is up. This is the one that we added. We created a IIIF manifest for this. So you can see that down here, IIIF manifest, the link there is via my own GitHub account. And so if we open that up, this is the manifest that was created. Then still building. We just have to wait for that one to pull in. Um, could be my internet is slowing things down. But basically when you look on a page where you pulled in the manifest, the link down at the bottom will just direct you back to where that manifest actually lives. So that would be a ransom center URL. And if you click on it, you'll end up here again. So that's how you add all of your audio. And then as you can see, when you're on this page for the audio, we have no data available in the annotation table. So now I will show you how you can do that. Let's go back in here and I'll add it to the interview from the Ransom Center. So, like Tanya was saying, Audio Annotate is not a tool for making annotations. It's just for attaching already existing annotations to your project. So most of the time when you come into Audio Annotate to start a project, your annotations will probably already be done. Um, and Tanya also mentioned there are several options for making your annotations. So one option is to make them in Audacity, which is a free open source platform you can download to your computer. Um, and you can use that. You will have to download the audio file itself in order to open it in Audacity. And then within Audacity, you make annotations using label tracks that you then export as a TXT file. 
And then the exported file is what you import to Audi Annotate. So if you've ever worked with Audacity or other audio management software, that might be the easiest thing for you. Um, but I'm gonna show you a more simple method, which is just to use a um, spreadsheet. So let me grab a link for you to this template in here, wherever it is. Okay. So I'll pop this in the chat for you. When you click this link, it should ask you to make a copy. So go ahead and make sure that you've done that so that we're not all working in the same spreadsheet. And you'll see here, this is kind of like our standard template for making annotations. And so the first tab gives you some instructions, how this works. And then in these other tabs, you will have um, space to make your annotations. So when you open one of these up, you'll see there are four columns, one for the start time, one for the end time, one for the annotation itself, and the last one is for the layer. So there are two kinds of annotations you can make. You can make a point annotation or a range annotation. A point annotation applies to a single point in time in the audio. And if you want to make an annotation like that, you would put the same timestamp in the start and end. So at maybe 30 seconds in, 30 seconds in, someone coughs, something like that. Um, you could also just put in a start time and leave the end time blank if you're doing a point annotation. If you're making a range annotation, you will have two distinct timestamps in your start and end time column. So maybe at 32 seconds until 56 seconds, uh, someone has a coughing fit. So it goes on for a while. And then that's a range annotation. One thing to note is that this template will automatically convert whatever timestamp you put in into total seconds elapsed. So if we said like one minute, 32 seconds, it's gonna change it. That's actually an hour, sorry. One hour, 32 minutes, it will change it into the total number of seconds. Or maybe that doesn't matter, whatever. Um, okay, and then so again, the annotation itself is in the third column. And then in the fourth column, you have the option to add a layer. So this is just a way of organizing your annotations. Um, you have a lot of freedom here. You can use it or not use it if it's helpful to you. So we might say like background noise for coughing. And then if someone drops something that would be filed under background noise. You might have something like transcript in here if you're just writing down what the speaker says, anything like that. And it's just gonna help you to organize your annotations when it's in the Audi Annotate project. Once you've added all the annotations that you want to add for your audio file, you will go ahead and download it um, as you can download it as a TSV, a CSV, or a XLSX file. Um, and then you'll be able to upload that file to your audio annotate project. So in the final tab of the spreadsheet template that I gave you, I have a set of annotations for the Ransom Center audio file, the Alice Walker interview. So I'll just go ahead and download this one as a TSV, which is my preferred file format. And then if we head back into Audio Annotate, I'll show you how we add it and associate it with the audio, audio file. So this is the page for the interview. Down here, you can see add annotation file. So we'll click choose file, downloads. It'll be this TSV that I just downloaded. I'll hit open and then I'll hit add. It's gonna open up this page that gives you kind of a preview of the annotation file. And then it asks you to configure the columns. So we're just gonna match the column with the content. So we do have a first row as a header in this, the template has a header row. And then the column that has the start time is column A, column B has the end time, the annotations in column C. We do have a layer column and it's in column D. Once we have that configured, we can hit process. And it brings you back to the page with the audio file. It shows you um, all of your annotations, and then you
you can see down here that we have some layers added and it has the name of the file here. So we know that it has been added and I think it should be, yeah, it'll be building for a minute. Eventually that button will say ready and then we'll know that the web page is ready for us to look at and all the annotations will be in there. So I can go ahead and close some of these other tabs and clean things up while we wait. This is where it will be when it's ready. You can see the audio file has been added now. We're just waiting for the annotations to come through. Still waiting. It's a little slow. I think it might be my internet today. Um, but that's how you build a basic here we go. So you can see all the annotations have shown up now. We have some ranges, we have some points, we have different layers. We'll be able to organize it by any of these three columns that we would like to. We can also search across the columns, and find all the laughs, something like that. Um, another cool feature is that when you click on the timestamp, it should bring you to that point in the audio. Sometimes this doesn't work for me and I'm not sure why, but it works on basically every other project anyone's ever made. Um, and then I'll just show you, that's my GitHub. Um, I wanted to show you a kind of more built out version of this project so that you could see what it looks like if you spend a little bit more time customizing everything, which you can do via the uh, back end on GitHub. So I need to pull up the actual project. Let's see. So for example, if I were doing a project on Alice Walker, I might want to add a photo of her. I could have a little bit of background information. Um, I can have multiple audio files. So here's one. I have information that the Harry Ransom Center provided. So I've included their description here, the audio player, all of my annotations. You can notice that I have links in my annotations. Um, and you can also do italics, so you can do basic HTML coding within the annotations themselves. And yeah, I think that was everything that I had to show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so that I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, we do have some questions that I'll start with. Of on the chat, um, let's see, Maybe Josh's comments. Uh, Corinne asked, what about licenses or copyrights on audio video files? So great question. We, um, one of the things that is great about IIIF is there's an auth, um, uh, why is that word escaping me? Auth um, standard, is that the word Josh I'm looking for? <laughs> Uh, and what that means is that if there is credentials needed on a particular asset, um, we will be able, not yet, but that is part of our development now at the end of, um, we have one more year funding on this project, hoping for more, um, and that will be part of it. So if you have authentication you know, privileges on a particular file, if you if the user has those credentials, they'll be able to see, play the actual um, AV file. If the user does not have those credentials, what's nice about it is they, they can still see the annotations. Um, and which is in some ways, you know, a form of access itself. If you think about liner notes on an album, you haven't bought it yet, but you read the liner notes and you learn about it and then you really want to buy it. Um, it actually motivates research in a way. Um, did that help? Any other questions about licenses or copyrights? That is actually something that um, Aviary is working on. So Aviary is, uh, as part of this project, is creating a, there's, there's only a handful of players out there. Universal Viewer is the one that we currently have hooked up. Um, 
Aviary is also developing one that is, uh, will be, they're, they're developing one that will be free to the public to use. Um, and we're gonna integrate, when it's ready, we're gonna integrate that one into Audio Annotate. So that'll be our default player. And that one will have the ability to um, utilize the auth, um, whatever word I'm, standard, whatever word I'm, I'm forgetting right now. Um, Spec or standard, yes, Josh says. So Josh says, if it's of interest to folks, our authentication TSG is working on this right now, aligning off with AV materials. Um, so that is definitely a hot topic, especially in the context of AV. So much of it is not freely available online. Um, so that can create an issue. Uh, and the other thing which is interesting is if, you know, if, if, a, if a cultural heritage institution does not deploy triple IF. What's nice about this project is you can create triple IF here. So let's say that um, institution doesn't have triple IF, doesn't have it, you know, formatted in the context of these off credentials. We can create that, and then that could actually be something that the they could then offer, um, which is interesting. An interesting way forward. Uh, another question, and Kaylee, this one is probably a good one for you to answer, is, is the tool also compliant with a screen reader and keyboard users? It, it meets um, all the basic accessibility standards. So yes, I think um, there are some things that we need to improve a little bit, but yeah, the simple answer is yes, it will work. And that's one of the things that um, we wanted to see how far we could get with um, adhering to the WC3 standards and, um, and obviously IIIF. Uh, and so I think when Kaylee did her research, she found that, that um, we could do better. And that's part of our next plan for development is to increase usability. And accessibility. Augment. Are there other questions from people? No. Uh, we could actually probably show you some more projects. The one project that I didn't show you is sort of an interesting story. We had, um, let me show you, let's see, where am I? On the right page. Uh, we, one of the projects we were working with is a machine learning project. And um, in our collaboration with Spoken Web, we, um, Spoken Web, uh, I was working with Brian McPhee, who is a um, musicologist and data scientist at NYU. Um, and Brian is amazing. He uh, does a lot of machine learning projects with audio, specifically, typically music, um, but was interested in spoken web recordings. And um, in his previous life as a graduate student, he had he was at Columbia and he had worked on um, the name of the database escapes me now, but uh, it sort of underlies Google's ability to um, translate or understand audio. And um, essentially, he was interested in how um, the, the free program that everybody uses um, to create transcripts, why that wasn't working very well. Um, uh, what is it called? Call, shoot, I forget what it's called. And um, he essentially wanted Kylie, who was an undergraduate working for us, to annotate places in these spoken web audio files where automatic um, transcription wasn't working very well. And he wanted to know what was happening in those um, audio files at the point in time when they when it, when it wasn't working well like was it 
you know, was there just a really loud air conditioner in the background? Was, um, did somebody have a really strong accent? Was it uh, that the audio recording at that moment in time was just really not very good? Um, you know, you know, was there distortion in either the, how it was recorded in the first place or in its, you know, transition into a digital file, et cetera. And so Kylie came up with what she called this um, scent metadata structure. I don't know if you can see it on this page. Uh, the example is on that audio and tape um, example page. And scent basically stands for speaker environment notes, transcription technology. And so, you know, she took this, this recording of Allen Ginsberg available through Spoken Web and went through and said, okay, um, this is a, a chant. There's a group here performing a chant that, that you know, is something that's happening here. Um, here Welcome the to the layer, fourth. She notices that there's, there's mic feedback, there's talking in the background, there's page turning, there's echoey room, there's coughs. Uh, you know, that's all happening in that space. And that's why the transcription didn't work well. And what was fun about this is that the Library of Congress liked it so much, this scent structure that they include, they're now including it in their FAGI guidelines. Um, and FAGI stands for the Federal Agency Digitization Guidelines Initiative. Uh, and they are recommending it as a, um, as a, really simple way to describe what is happening in the context of a particular um, audiovisual format. So this is just an example of, um, she also did Market Atwood in 1974. Um, gosh, what is the, maybe somebody, somebody on the, is anyone remembering what this, what this, um, the free automatic transcription, software that everybody uses starts with a K. Nobody knows. I forget. It was part of my prepared talk. Um, no, but thank you. Not conch. Uh, uh, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Um, so that was a really interesting part of, you know, trying to use annotations as part of a machine learning project because Back in the day, before you know, before we had neural networks and machine learning, machine learning was driven by annotations that people would create. Um, and so, this was a really easy way to create annotations and have them served up in a way where multiple people can collaborate. It um, anything you can do in GitHub, you can utilize in the context of a collaborative project in Audi Annotate. So you can have multiple users, you can have people signing in, you can have, um, you, can, you can generally organize a collaborative project, know who's done what, when they've done it, you know, have different versions, um, those kinds of things behind the scene if you want to, or you can also, if you want to run a class uh, like the, lesson plan that you know, we were offering around the Beecher article. If you just want to run a class where students are working with audio files and they're creating their own annotations, it's really just, um, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, GitHub isn't perfect and GitHub won't be there forever. Um, but for the time being, it's a really nice free place that a classroom can use, um, easily accessible if you have, if you have the internet, of course. Um, and a computer um, that is a lightweight means of using audio in the classroom or for small research projects as well. So you have examples here of small research projects in the classroom, stuff you can, I mean, I teach all the time and sometimes students create things that are amazing and sometimes students create things that are awful, but um, this is a way that you can, they can share them if they want to and you know, you're, you're out of it, <laughs> you're outy. Uh, and, but it's also a way that students can create things that they're proud of and that they can point to forever. So, or, you know, however long forever lasts on the internet. Um, are there other questions? Anything else? This is, this is inspired. Um, I'm trying to figure out what it is. Oh. 
called? Um, it doesn't matter. I don't see any other questions. All right, well, uh, this is my email address. If people have questions, I'm putting it in the chat. Um, and if you have questions for Kaylee, you can, you can send them to me or Kaylee can include her email address if she wants to, but she doesn't have to because she's, she's Kaylee. <laughs> so uh, if uh, people have questions, please feel free to reach out to us and hopefully you'll use the website and um, we'll see how easy it is to use. Thank you guys for coming. We'll hang out for a second if anybody has extra questions. I'm still dying to figure out. It starts with a K. Um, Caldi? Caldi. I know it's called Caldi. How do you spell it? Glad we got it. Yeah. I'll stop the recording now that we've accomplished it. I know, I know. It's Caldi. Uh, 